Good morning. morning. Welcome to St. Paul's and a special welcome to our visitors who are with us today. This morning, Jesus wants to teach us more what it means to be blessed. Some people think of being blessed as how much stuff you have or how far you advance in life or how many people you have around you. But Jesus teaches us about blessings for the lowly. And we'll hear more about that in our scripture lessons and our songs. We'll follow along with the order of service as it's printed out in your bulletin and projected on the screen, beginning with our opening hymn, 415. Please stand. Oh, Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, oh God. Give 
Give glory to God, our light and our life. Let us pray. Father of glory, you reveal your greatness in showing mercy. Send us as peacemakers and witnesses to all people and fill our hearts with joy in your gift of salvation. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may take your seats for the scripture lessons. Our first lesson is taken from Zephaniah chapters 2 and 3, selected verses. It reminds us just how blessed we will be to stand in the the day of the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you humble people of the earth who have carried out his commands. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Maybe then you will be sheltered in the day of the Lord's anger. In that day you will no longer bear the shame of your rebellions against me, Then I will remove the proud boasters from among you, and you will never again be arrogant on my holy hill. But I will leave among you the people who are humble and weak. They will seek refuge in the name of the Lord. The Israelites who remain will no longer act unjustly. They will not lie, and a deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouth. Instead, they will graze peacefully like sheep and lie down. No one will terrify them. This is the word of our God. Continue with the anthem by the Junior Choir.
Our second lesson is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you're watching the big game later today, you may hear a little bit of boasting. We're the best. I'm the greatest. We as Christians can boast too, but we who are weak and foolish on our own, we boast in the Lord and his strength and wisdom and power. For example, consider your call, brothers. Not many of you were wise from a human point of view. Not many were powerful, and not many were born with high status. But God chose the foolish things of the world to put to shame those who are wise. God chose the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are strong. And God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to do away with the things that are so that no one may boast before God. But because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God, namely our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God did this so that, just as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Please stand in honor of the gospel. The gospel for today from Matthew chapter 5 will serve as the basis for our sermon. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up onto a mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. He said these things, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, because they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. In fact, that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of the Lord. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You may be seated for the hymn of the day.
In the name of Jesus, our one and only Savior, fellow believers in him. The one great thing a trip to Israel does, which is where I just got back from, is it gives you such perspective. I mean, you begin to realize Israel's a real place. It's, it, it's a nation with real borders and boundaries. It's, it's a place where Jesus walked. It has hills and valleys and deserts and plains. It has choke points for militaries to go through. It has thousands of years of history. And as you're driving around on your bus tour and listening to your tour guide, I mean, these Bible stories we've had for so many years, through Sunday school, through grade school, through high school, for me anyway, even through college and then seminary, boy, they just sort of pop. They come to life. I mean, for instance, we, we went to the place where Jesus said these words of Matthew chapter 5. We saw the hill. We saw the Sea of Galilee in the background. Boy, the birds just all over the place were singing and chirping. And I don't know where Jesus would have sat down, but somewhere in there, and I actually was gifted to be the one to read these words from Matthew chapter 5, right where Jesus likely would have said them. Just incredible. Just incredible. And, and I wish I could have that for you today. We, we don't have the Sea of Galilee in the background. We don't have this big hill or mount. We don't have this place where Jesus sat down to begin speaking. But you know what? We have the greatest thing. If we just have the word. The word of God that Pastor Bodie read for you today. These are the unshakable. These are the fertile. These are the timeless words of God himself. And 2,000 years ago when Jesus spoke them. To 2,000 years later in your hearing. They still give the exact same thing. They proclaim over you heaven's highest congratulations. Because that's what it means to be blessed. To be blessed is to have God's congratulations in Jesus Christ that you have his declaration of righteous and you have all of the work of Jesus Christ on your account. There's nothing greater than that. It doesn't get any better than that. Do you remember in grade school, we at least did in my day, when you would banter back and forth with some of your classmates and somebody would say, ah, I've got 10 of those. And somebody else would say, well, I've got 1,000 of those. Somebody else would say, well, I've got a million of those. And then it would go to a billion. And, and somebody finally would get to that, well, I have infinity. And you just knew whoever got to infinity first, that was the winner. Because you know some poor classmate was about to say, well, I have infinity plus one. But it just doesn't work like that. You, you know the battle is lost when you get to infinity. That's the person who wins. It's the same in the kingdom of God. There's no such thing as blessed plus one, blessed plus two, blessed plus blessed. It's just blessed. That's as good as it gets. That's the highest congratulations God can give. Because blessed means you have the judgment of God, the verdict of God granted through faith in Jesus Christ. That you're right with him. And when you're right with him, everything is right that needs to be right. And in our lesson today from Matthew chapter 5, listen very carefully to the kind of people that receive that congratulations. To the kind of people Jesus calls Blessed, are you included? It says in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word poor here means you're broke. You're, you're a beggar. You don't have a penny to your name. You're bankrupt in a sense. You live by begging. You need to depend on other people. But we're not talking about financial status here. We're talking about a spiritual status. Blessed are those who are beggars who don't have a spiritual scent on their spiritual account in their heart and life. Because they look elsewhere for it. They look to God for it. Heaven's highest congratulations to the children of this congregation 
who, even if they have the ability to go to the magic kingdom, and maybe they do get to go, their heart doesn't necessarily crave it. They don't have to go there. Instead, they love to come here. They love to come to this house. They love to hear the word of God because their heart craves for what God's eternal kingdom can give. Are you, are you parents, are you teaching your kids? Are you helping them understand their severe poverty? their spiritual poverty, that they are dead broke when it comes to the Lord and that they need what, what he has? Are you teaching them in desperation to look to him? Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. The word mourn there means to cry, cry out loud, to wail as loud as it gets. And it maybe pictures those professional mourners who had come to the house Back in the day when, when somebody would die, can you imagine? I, I saw some of these small little places where, where Jesus, we were in Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, and it would have been a small place at the top of a hill. Can you imagine walking through that little town? Maybe you could hear the wailing and mourning and the crying even at the opposite end of the town. God says that person's blessed when they mourn and wail at the consequences of sin, that sin has taken a loved one from them. Or in the greater context, blessed are those who mourn over sin itself because there is comfort. Um, can you imagine, can you imagine if I was presiding over a funeral and, and it was a tough one, can you imagine if I would go up on the day of the funeral to those relatives, surviving relatives, and if I would look them with a smile and a genuine smile, and I would mean it, nothing can, but I would look them in the eye and, and I would say, oh, how blessed you are on a day like today. I don't think that would go over very well. But that's exactly what Jesus says. Blessed are those who mourn. Next one. He says, blessed are the gentle because they will inherit the earth. I, I, in this one, I envisioned all of you as having a professional job, as being an over-the-road truck driver, and, and you're hauling a 48-foot trailer. I know some of the people in our congregation actually do that, whether they're driving a milk truck or something like that. They're, they're driving a big rig. They're hauling something big. You've got to be very careful. Just imagine if you're driving something, though, that, that has chemicals, and you know a spill is going to be hazardous to everybody in that neighborhood, wherever that happens, or on the road. And so you are driving with care. And yet, what do all these little drivers do all around? They cut right in front of you and they cut you off? And you know what we like to say, that must be an Illinois driver. Except you look and it says Wisconsin on the back of the car. Because I think Wisconsin drivers probably are like Illinois drivers too. Or you look down, as I worked in college with people who actually hauled lumber products to lumber yards, they would tell me, they would look down and they would see people fiddling with their phones and doing foolish stuff and not paying attention and drifting across lanes, doing all of these idiotic things, placing other people around them in jeopardy or the car that actually pulls in front of you but it has plenty of space but they slow down and so it forces the big rig to slow down too. Do you know what gentle is? Gentle is that quiet disposition of faith that Jesus has given to you that in application then it doesn't turn into road rage. It, it doesn't go, it doesn't have a trigger. No matter what the object of somebody else is doing out there, you stay content. Are you driving your life that way? That regardless of what others do around you, that you are gentle in your dealings with them and not getting distorted and contorted out of, out of place? Next one. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. We had a dog growing up, a, a Westie, a West Highland White Terrier. It's a little white dog. They're, they're pretty intelligent. And my mom trained this dog, a great dog named Cookie. You wanted Cookie right by your chair at dinner time. And there's a trick, even if she wasn't there, we knew all you had to do was tap your foot gently in the carpet, nobody could hear it, but Cookie under the table would see it. And Cookie would come and she would park herself right by your chair. And so all you had to do was look down at her, you'd lock eyes and there'd be a lick of the snout. 
but he knew something was coming. And if you just gave a little furtive glance, and it wasn't that long, you'd see her muscles tighten a little bit, and she'd shimmy maybe half an inch forward in anticipation, still poised, holding her spot. But she patiently waited for something to come. She just knew it was time. And being a parsonage, we had the church key back in the day. There weren't many keys, so the pastor's house had the key to get into the church. And so during dinner time, we'd often get interrupted because people were coming for that key and they'd go let themselves in. And when their business was done, they'd have to return the key. So we're getting frequently interrupted. And so we expected the doorbell to ring. And yet, when that doorbell would ring during supper, Cookie would stay right there, would not go to the door, would not bark because what was on the dinner table was more important. And, and if mom and dad would go answer that door to give out the key because they were the responsible ones, Cookie knew there might be a little something in it right there for her. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness the same way? I mean, I mean a dog understands. Do you and I as Christians understand even what an animal understands? That when we look with patience, when we look with focus to the Lord, when we hunger and thirst, and that Greek word for hunger, it kind of has this English-sounding word of pine. When you pine away for what the Lord has on his table, he says he's going to give it. You will be filled. Is your stomach starving? Is your soul and throat so thirsty for the righteous things that only God can give? Or is there other stuff? Blessed are the merciful, it says, because they will receive mercy. That's just like our Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Mercy and forgiveness, really the same thing. Pity for poor, for somebody who's in, in a certain state, whether it's the Good Samaritan, merciful, or whether it's somebody who does something against you. Are you somebody who shows mercy? Are you somebody who brings forgiveness to the table in the situation at hand? Or are you somebody who holds a grudge and doesn't let things go. Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. A little plug, next week, Sunday, during Bible class hour, we're going to show a one-hour video in here in place of our regular Bible class in the gym. There's a really neat one-hour presentation a pastor from Florida in our circles did. It's really exceptionally done, and you'll be blessed to hear it. It was done a week and a half ago at our Lutheran Leadership Conference. I believe it happened in northern Illinois. But this guy was just exceptional. And so I hope it's an invitation to come to it. But, but a little piece of that. For a little bit, while he was putting himself or taking care of his family, he worked at a funeral home. And he's talking about embalming. And he's, he got so good at embalming, and, and he was describing in general that when they embalm at the funeral home, usually you're doing it all alone. Nobody else is around. And he said there's a sign on the wall when they were embalming at that funeral home that said, this body, treat this body as if it is the most precious possession of the relatives. And treat it, if, if I remember correctly, treat it as if they were standing right here. And he said, we did. Do you know what purity of heart is? It's doing the right thing even when nobody else is watching. Purity of heart is following through when and because God is watching. Do you treat your neighbor and his possessions and his livelihood and his reputation with that degree of integrity? Don't you just want to interrupt Jesus' sermon right here? And we're not even all the way through the Beatitudes. We only went through six of them. Don't you just want to interrupt them and say, Stop! <laughs> Lord, I've had enough. Don't go any further. Stop your preaching. Because there's not one of us who does this. 
There's not one of us who thinks like this. There's not one of us who acts like this. Even if we were standing all together in Israel and we had the Sea of Galilee in the background and we had the hill there and we had Jesus sitting wherever he was sitting, even if we had that full perspective, there's not one of us who has this perspective of Scripture. Who carries this out? Or, or you tell me, fill in the blanks for me today and for all of us, and I'll do the same. You tell me the last time somebody gave it to you and they swore at you and they cursed at you and they took your name in vain and they trashed your family and they trashed your marriage. I remember the last time somebody did that to me. And you tell me what you are thinking in your heart at that moment. You tell me if you're thinking, wow, what a privilege it is to be counted among the prophets of the past. How blessed am I? Or were you thinking something a little bit different? You tell me the last time you had the opportunity to be merciful when somebody else was pig-headed or completely out of line. And you tell me if you were. Which means every single one of us when we came to God's house this morning, if we're really merciful, that means there's not one of us holding a grudge against anybody else. Can that rightfully be said about every single one of us that we have completely forgiven and let go every single foolish, sinful thing somebody has done against us? Or do we have a record there? <laughs> go ahead. Let's pull out our finances, our financial reports and statements this morning. Let's, let's show everybody what's in there. Let's not hide anything. And let's show everybody just how important we see and value the kingdom of God because it's going to reflect itself in our financial statements, isn't it? Or, or will it show that the world still thrills us and we're still heavily invested in this world? Or, or no, don't show it. Because Facebook pretty much today shows it all, doesn't it? By the pictures that are on there. Or we can talk to the friends that you talk to. Don't you just want Jesus for once to be honest with us this morning? Tell us how it truly is. Tell us the truth, Jesus. Don't hold anything back. Tell us what the real verdict of God is on us. Because we don't act like this. And if we don't act like this, are we blessed? Tell us the real verdict. Tell us. Tell us we're cursed. But he doesn't. Not once. Nine times. Nine times in these 12 verses he says blessed. To those disciples that came before him 2,000 years ago, nine times he called them blessed. To the disciples that have come repentantly today to his house to hear his word, Nine times he says over you, blessed. Now, mind you, that's not a blessing. A blessing and blessed are two different things. The blessing at the end of our service today, a very important thing, that's God proclaiming a blessing and putting his name on you. But to be blessed means that's who you are. That's already who you are in God's sight. And so this is God saying, this is who you are. This is according to the will of God, by the power of God, what he has declared over you. And you know what? God doesn't lie. And so it begs the question, how? How can this be? How can you say this over us, Jesus, when we don't think this way, when we don't act this way, when, when what's in our hearts and minds is sin? How can you say this about us? And the simple answer is because Jesus Jesus makes it so. The one who climbed up that mount that day and sat down and opened his mouth and said these things as teacher that day to the people and blessed them is the same one who later in life stood up and was placed on a cross and displayed for the world to see the heart of God and that he's your savior. Jesus made it so. Heaven's highest congratulations are yours. 
Because what Jesus did is he didn't think like the world. He didn't act like the world. He didn't do it the way you and I do and the way the world does it. His is the one life that did it the way God wanted it done. And so what he did is he took the complete sin of the world into himself. And so you look long and hard, and I'll look with my, in my own too. You look inside your heart. You look at all of those things where uh, you wanted to insult, and maybe you did. And, and maybe you let loose a few words, choice words, and let somebody have it. And maybe your temper flared, and you weren't so gentle when maybe you should have been. And, and maybe your finances show something that, that's not very good. And maybe your children, well, maybe they weren't given the quality of scriptural teaching God wanted them to have when he gave you to them as their parent. And so what God did is he took all of those sins in mine. And he placed them entirely on his son Jesus. For you to see. So that in Jesus, God calls you blessed because Jesus took God's highest curse. You understand the same thing we said about blessing is the same thing we can say about curse. There's no blessed plus one. There's no such thing as cursed plus one, which means there's nothing God left out when he put it all on Jesus. It was all put on him so that you today, having your sins paid in full, seeing that price paid in Jesus' life on the cross, so that you would have what you need. The heart of God in Jesus credited to you the work of God in that obedient life given to you, all the perfect words of Jesus placed on your account, all of the work of Jesus. We, we call this in simplicity, we call it righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for this righteousness that Jesus freely provides in the cross because you're going to be filled. It's fully yours for free. Which means heaven's highest congratulations are in order, Christian. Because you are blessed. You're blessed when you're at the office or you're blessed when you're at some sporting event or you're blessed hearing the word of God at church. You're blessed in your life when it hurts because God doesn't remove his blessing and you're blessed when you're, when you're in laughter. You're blessed when you're having a hard time but you're practicing mercy to somebody who doesn't deserve it and, and you're blessed when you're purely in heart serving your neighbor even when they're not watching. Blessed. If you read through and take this bulletin home later today and you read through these 12 verses, notice in many of those verses there's a lack. Poor in spirit. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You're blessed because what the Christian does is wherever there's a lack in our life, we look to the Lord to be the solution and the answer and the Savior and the forgiver and the Redeemer and, and the teacher. And we fill up on everything he has. Heaven's highest congratulations are yours. Huge congrats. Because rich reward awaits you in heaven. By God's promise. Let's have that perspective. Let's live that perspective. And be blessed. Amen. Please stand. Please turn in your worship folder to pages 8 and 9, and according to the directions there, we will sing the Te Deum.
You may take your seats for the offering. At this point in our service, we invite up the congregational leaders uh, for the installation. Dear brothers in Christ, in holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ freed you from sin and death and made you members of his body, the church. Through word and sacrament, you have been nurtured in faith. The Spirit has seen fit to give you gifts for serving on behalf of our congregation. You have now been nominated and elected to positions of leadership at St. Paul's. Officers, council, and board members. The Lord says, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. He asks you to carry out your duties to the best of your ability, using your gifts to his glory and for the good of his people. And the same Lord who has given you gifts for service will give you strength to use them faithfully and will bless your work in his name. As leaders in our congregation, it is also important to set an example for your families and for your fellow believers in your Christian living and in your faithful use of the means of grace, God's word and sacraments. These will empower you and guide you in your tasks. Will you carry out the positions to which you have been elected according to the ability which God gives you? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I now install you as officers, councilmen, and board members in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And now, members of St. Paul's, I urge you to regard these leaders as servants of Jesus, and, give, and gifts to his church. Pray for them, support them in their service, and help them, so that through the gospel ministry of our congregation, more people will hear and believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And at this time, we're going to give each of the men up here an opportunity to turn around, say your name, and how you're serving this year on the board or whichever committee you're on, and then which year, or how many years you've been doing this now. Jeremy Pieper, trustee. I'm in my third year. Joey Bulgi, financial secretary, first year. Eric Eikhoff, board of elders, just elected to my first year. Jim Van Alstein, treasurer. I'm in my first year. Ron Cleese, board of elders, second year. Jeremy Neesman, uh, stewardship, first year. Travis Crow, Board of Education, starting my fourth year. No, the Board of Ed guys were incorrectly listed, so Travis Krell is one of the names that should be in the bulletin. Just want to point him out for Board of Ed. We'll do it again at the end here, too. Todd Martin, President, fourth year. John Martin, Board of Trustees, third year. Craig Sheenaman, Sunday School, second year. Zach Ewald, Board of Education, first year. So, Zach is also on the Board of Education, and, and thank you for that. All right, we would also at this time like to thank those board members and officers whose terms have come to an end. May the Lord graciously bless you for your service in his name. Now you may all go back to your seats. Depart in peace. Amen. At this time, then, the congregation is invited to rise, for the Lord have mercy. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Jesus, in your all-surpassing wisdom, you teach us that because of you, 
We are blessed, blessed to possess the kingdom of heaven, no matter what hardship or weakness we face on earth. Lead us to rejoice in that heavenly kingdom, willingly suffer loss for that kingdom, and share the good news of that kingdom with all. Lord, you are our good shepherd who leads us to lie down in peace. We thank you for tending to the needs of Sharon Paul after her recent heart procedures and Jim Ike after his recent foot surgery. Continue to grant relief and recovery for these, your sheep. Holy Spirit, we praise you for the gifts that you have given to your people for service in your church. Please bless our congregational leadership installed today as they take up their responsibilities once again for this year. Use all of us in our weakness so that your strength and wisdom and glory may be known. And Heavenly Father, please watch over Lenora Girak as her health has taken a turn and she may be, according to what we can tell, nearing the end of her time in this world. Please grant her relief. Please lead her to continue to hold strong to you until the end. And when the time is right, deliver her into her heavenly home, bought for and paid by your Son, the Savior of all. Please continue to watch over the entire Girak family at this time as well. And in Jesus' name we join to pray. Our, Our Father, who art, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power, and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless and keep you. Amen. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. The Lord grant you peace for all your days.